This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining me today. With me is Richard Fields in the middle and John Cameron down at the other end. Gentlemen, a survey came out that said crimes against Asians declined in 2020. And yet, here we've been having this uh, narrative that you know, hate crimes against Asians have increased. Now, maybe the, the crimes that the media are showing us have increased. Maybe in places like San Francisco and L.A., crime is increasing in general, and so more crimes will be going against Asians, and they want to uh, promote that, I suppose. But this data isn't backing up the narrative. Again, uh, what do you guys have to say about that? Well, I'm uh, I'm I'm not surprised that the the data disagrees with the narrative. That's that seems to be a, a common nowadays with our uh, with our uh, fear mongering, slanted uh, pick and choose media. And I actually have personal knowledge. Uh, my I I, I um, talk to a lot of people who are Asians. Um, a dentist. And uh, was talking about, um, you know, I'm hearing all this stuff about, uh, you know, Asians being, you know, uh, targeted and hated and all the rest of that because of, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the virus, as Epoch Times call it, the CCCP virus, but everybody else calls it COVID. And uh, she said, I'm not seeing any of that. And I said, I'm not seeing any of it either. But then again, I'm not Asian. And, you know, I, I do a lot of my writing from coffee houses where there's, you know, lots of Asian medical students and, uh, you know, there, there's a big Asian population in Sacramento, as you well know, James Just. Um, and I'm not hearing it from anybody. So, uh, you know, I mean, and that's a small sample size, but I'm not shocked at all about the survey because, you know, the survey uh, reveals, has revealed in the past some, some pretty uh, powerful numbers that go against the narrative, some of the narratives of the lamestream media, and I'm not shocked at all by by this being the case. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I, I, the, as far as violent crime against Asians, probably uh, not a problem, but there is a crime against Asians which is totally celebrated by the uh, the liberal side of the media, and that is the crime of excluding talented, smart Asians from uh, colleges, universities, including the University of California, because they're too smart and they're overrepresented because they're too smart. Yeah. This is a function of the fact, it's not that Asians are smarter than Caucasians necessarily, it's, a, it's the fact that most, are, 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 there are more Asians who are recent immigrants to the United States than there are uh, white folks who are recent immigrants to the United States. And there's a natural selection process that goes that 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 uh, controls who immigrates. It's not the people who are lazy and uh, non-industrious that immigrate. It's the people who are uh, industrious, people who are risk takers, people who are smart enough to figure out there's a better place to be. Those are the people who immigrate, and those are the people who, uh, number one, we are trying to prevent from immigrating, much to our uh, much to our own uh, bad bad outcome. They are also the people who, once they get here, uh, once they, you know, brave boats to get out of Vietnam or brave uh, Trumpian immigration processes to get through immigration, those are the people who, once they're here, we're saying, nah, you can't go to college. We have to make room for uh, us, uh, you know, for, for, for other minority groups other than Asian. And it's, 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 it's a crime against ability, a crime against uh, industriousness, it's, it's, it's an awful thing. And that's going on and it's going on and being applauded and encouraged by liberals. And there's you know, to well spoken, Richard, well said. And, you know, just some examples, the uh, they have uh, Lowell High School in, in San Francisco is a uh, merit entrance high school. That's uh, I think, you know, some Nobel laureates have come out of it. And they're putting in racial quotas, um, and and I guess uh, the the current mayor is trying to remove um, scholastic merit from the entrance requirements. Uh, they've done the same thing in New York. They're doing it in colleges and all the rest of that. And and you know basically, uh, it's unconstitutional. The Constitution and all the Supreme Court rulings and all 
uh, I think, circuit court rulings, except for maybe the ninth, have stated that that um, establishing admission based upon race is uh, um, excluding people based upon race or, or admitting people based upon race is unconstitutional. And, you know, you, it comes to a zero-sum game eventually. If you punish the best and the brightest for being the best and the brightest, they're going to go somewhere else, as has happened with those people, as Richard rightly pointed out, who come here. And if we don't treat that human capital people uh, with with dignity and respect and, and, and lack of barriers to them making better life for themselves, they're going to find someplace else to go. You know, they'll go to Singapore. Uh, they'll go to Ireland. They'll go somewhere where where they're well treated. And uh, that's a shame because as Richard rightfully pointed out, you know, our, the, the success of this country is built upon wave after wave of immigrants. It always has been. And, and if uh, these politicians get their heads out of the sand, um, then hopefully it will be in the future. And that is a crime that's, that's obvious and it's on front pages and it's being applauded. Now, if the same thing were done to black Americans, what do you think uh, the reaction of the liberal press would be? What do you think? Well, well it depends on, on who the other person is. Because yeah. as we found out with the Dave Chappelle, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, you have the hierarchy of, of what, offended groups. Who gets yeah. to be offended and who gets to be offended more. And, and yeah, it's, it's uh, anyway. And yeah. remember, John, you talked about the constitutionality. These people are the people who say they don't care about your freedoms. They don't care about our Constitution. So, you know, whether it's constitutional or not, they're going to try to do it. It's whether we allow them to. Yeah. But speaking of us allowing them to, Democrats could hide $2 trillion in spending with budget gimmicks, which is, you know, you know how these things are, ten year, a 10-year ten budget, 10-year budget. You know, it's completely useless. This, it's The spending is... They're spending they're going to try to do because we can change it next year if they want to. So what they're going to try and do is they're going to try and get these programs started, just like the high speed rail. You get once you get it started, then getting it stopping is, is exceedingly, exceedingly difficult. Yeah, I mean, what we have is a situation where the Congressional Budget Office, which actually which scores the actual cost of what a, a given uh, bill will, will cost over time, uses a 10-year uh, time frame. That's arbitrary. That's that's what they use. That's fine. But the Democrats and the Republicans play it by saying, okay, we're going to start this new freebie program. In this particular case, uh, we're talking about o Obamacare subsidies and the uh, child tax credit of, uh, of $3,000 plus another $600 if the child is under five or six. Uh, so we're, we're going to say that this will end conveniently, not in the budget window of 10 years, it'll end in five years, thereby uh, actually cutting the cost of the program in half when, with a wink and a nod, everybody understands that once a giveaway program is in place, it's going to continue indefinitely. Uh, it's, it's cynical, it's uh, manipulative, and most importantly, it's, we can't afford it. It's, it's so expensive that it is ridiculously unaffordable. Right now, we, you know, there's nobody that decries defense spending more than I do. But we have to recognize that even though we are spending way too much money on defense, that's dwarfed by the amount of money that we're spending on, uh, on essentially welfare programs, transfer, transfer programs from one uh, class of people to another. I'm talking about Social Security, I'm talking about Medicare, I'm talking about all of these programs that we all think that we are, have earned, which we haven't, uh, but we uh, we believe that they're great programs because we personally benefit. And that's what this child welfare credit will uh, turn into. The same thing is happening with the Obamacare subsidies. Uh, the way to uh, get rid of these programs is to simply get rid of them and let the chips fall where they may. And I believe me, once those chips have fallen, uh, we'll all end up with a lot more effective uh, health care at a lower cost will also end up with uh, ways to take care of children that are a heck of a lot better than uh, than getting uh, tax credits, namely not paying the tax in the first place. I agree. And I, I have a, a new, uh, a new uh, conspiracy theory, but again, I don't think... I, I was talking to a brilliant attorney a while back about government conspiracies, and he said, 
yeah, they're not they're not smart enough to to come up with a plan they can keep uh, secret before the fact, but they're very good at keeping secrets after the fact. And he asked uh, this question: said uh, how how uh, many uh, FOIA requests do you think are are fully? That's uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, which. Uh, if supposedly, if the government has some information, you can file a lawsuit uh, being citizens that gives you access to this information against it, unless it's, of course, national defense stuff and they lump everything under it. And he said, how many of those do you think are actually fully responded to when, when, when they ask somebody to provide information on a FOIA request? And it isn't. But here's my new rant, my new conspiracy theory. I think that all of this stuff does have a purpose. All this stuff that we sit and talk about on Libertarian Counterpoint has one end game in mind. And that end game is we know that, that these the, the power-hungry politicians, and all power-hungry, benefit uh, by, by, by crisis, either manufactured crisis or real crisis. They use the opportunity of a crisis they've either created or invented to gain more power. What will gain these politicians more power than the complete and total eco economic collapse of the United States? And if you keep spending money, it's bound to happen because no time in history has a fiat currency ever survived, and it won't. One of these days, the, we're going to have to pay the piper. And I think that might well, be Well, yeah, the, the, the problem with that... Quicker you can take power. The problem with that, uh, you know, if you're thinking about the uh, the self-interest of the elites is that, like Rome, the uh, vandals uh, will invade. And they'll, they'll all be, you know, not only us plebes will be uh, in a sorry state of affairs, but so will, so will the empire, or mm. the emperor. Well, but they're the vandals, though. They're, we're being vandalized from the inside, not from the outside. Uh, yeah, I know, but the vandals from outside will see the opportunity and take it. I'm talking about uh, ascended uh, empires like, you know, like the Chinese, who are uh, very close to taking over not just Hong Kong, but probably Taiwan as well. And we'll sit by and, and watch, I'm not saying we should get involved, we shouldn't, but it's just one more sign that we, through our own... Uh, self-destructive behavior are encouraging adventurism on the part of other countries who would be the next empire. Mm -hmm. uh, and all empires fail. They'll, the Chinese empire, if it, uh, if it succeeds, if it becomes one, it'll fail over time as well. But uh, ours will fall first. Mm -hmm. Well, right. I don't know. The Chinese yeah, empire can't even keep electricity on there, John, uh, Richard. So I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> their, their electrical grid's worse than ours here in California. So... You know, and I want to remember, John, this, you're talking about the conspiracy. I'm not entirely sure these people are confident enough to pull off a conspiracy <laughs> like that. Where even where all you have to do is spend money to, to drive it. I'm not sure they're confident enough. I don't think they can actually manage to pull it off because what they try to do is they buy votes. I don't think they're thinking long term enough. They just want to buy votes. And so all these social programs, all these social spendings are simply trying to buy votes. Well, well, yeah, and, the, and they're trying to direct money into their own pockets, which they're very, very successful in doing. If you take a look at the uh, at the 1%, the people who Bernie Sanders likes to rail against, they are, they are all almost without exception people who are benefiting from government spending programs. I'm talking about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, subsidies and uh, bailouts that the large banks get whenever they overextend themselves making bad loans. I'm talking about the uh, protection from competition that Facebook is asking for and will probably get uh, simply by kowtow kowtowing to the censorship requirements the government wants to uh, put in place. These are, are people who, these are, these are government protected monopolies. Those are the people that are in the 1%. Those are the people who keep the government, keep the politicians in high clover uh, in return for the politicians keeping them in high clover as long as the, uh, the funny money lasts. But the thing that, you know, as Everett, Everett Dirksen said back in the 60s, I think it was, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're, you're talking about real money. Well, now it's a trillion here, trillion here, a trillion there, and pretty soon you're talking about fake money. Mm. Yeah. And yes. I, I agree with you, James, that, that I don't think they're, they're consciously capable of uh, that kind of long-term thinking. And, and I agree with you, Richard, that, that the, the primary initial goal is to buy votes. 
And I think probably this is a discussion better had over a second or third drink sometime. Um, <laughs> maybe even with my, my inability to consume alcohol without it affecting my brain, one for me. Um, but I, you know, the, how people can, can not see the obvious is, is just, it's frightening to me. And we keep electing them. But anyway, I know we've got more ground to cover. So. Well, actually, it's, it's, you've done a nice segue there because maybe people are starting to see the obvious. More Democrats oppose Biden's economic stimulus proposals than support it. They're supporting the mansion and how do you pronounce her name? Simona? Simona, I think. Yeah. They're, 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 there are more people are starting to support their smaller, smaller version of the stimulus package. So yeah, but, yeah, let's keep in mind, keep it, this is not, not forget that Manchin and Cinema are still supporting a, a tremendously wasteful uh, increased spending program. They're just saying a little bit less, sort of like Me Too Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they, you know, in a different world, they probably would be not Democrats, but Me Too Republicans. But the interesting thing is people are beginning to realize that, hey, you know, we're, we're talking about spending way more money than we have and saying that uh, that Biden is kowtowing to the, the progressives and the, the Bernie Ice and Cinema and Manchin are at least saying, let's let's uh, tap on the brakes, not, not, not slam on the brakes, but tap on them gently to uh, slow, it, slow this whole thing down just a little bit. No, well, I don't think you're tapping the brakes there. I don't, I don't even think they're reaching for the brake. If we want to news, use that analogy, they don't have cruise control set at 1,000. You know, they want to set it at 500. So yeah. at least they're accelerating at a lower a lower speed. But, yeah, that's a better, a better analogy, yes. Yeah, the, the uh, you know, the fact that, that uh, Democrats are still, in general polls, still supporting Biden, it I don't think so. I think I think Biden's support overall is is below fifty percent, and even among Democrats, I'm not sure it's a majority. Yeah. Well, I think I think a big part of that's the independence, and I I know we're going to touch on that in in a minute. We're going to touch on the the polls about uh, where or is that something else I was researching on my own? That, no. Go ahead. Yeah. That the um, a recent recent poll. I'm trying to. It was probably Reason Magazine was talking about you know where uh, where uh, Biden's popularity is and, and all the rest of that. And it's uh, it's the, the Democrats are still big, big supporters. But the, the fact that uh, this is, oh, it's a Gallup poll. Yeah. And, um, something like 60% of the electorate in this country self-identify as independents if you poll them. Now, you know, the uh, uh, critics of this argument would say that once – once an election happens, they still line up under one of the two parties. But they pointed out that if, uh, you know, Biden got the, the uh, especially the big part of libertarian vote that, that, uh, that went for, that didn't go for Johnson, that went for uh, Trump the first time, he didn't get it the second time. And the independents uh, supported uh, Trump in 16, but they, they voted against him in droves in uh, 20 and voted for Biden. But now the, his approval rating among people who have self-identified through polling as independents was at 61% at the election. Now they say it's dropped 27 percentage points down to 30 something percent support by the 60% of the populace that self-identifies as independent. So I would look at it another way. He has less than half of the support by people that is 60% of the populace than he did when he was elected. So people are starting to realize that this, the emperor has no clothes and uh, that uh, um, you call him weekend at Bernie's president, uh, Richard, I like that. Uh, he doesn't know what he's doing, that he's uh, supporting programs that, that can't possibly work and just, you know, good old boy politics over and over again. And, uh, you know, so the those people that got him elected are are very mad at him right now, and they're mad at the other people that are spending money hand over fist. So, you know, the midterms could be very interesting. Uh, yeah, the only problem with the with the whole uh, political system that we have, and and the, the fact that Biden is showing up poorly in the polls, is this: we still have a effectively uh, effectively have a duopoly, Republicans mm -hmm. and Democrats, and the Republicans have been taken over by the Trumpistas, 
uh, you know, until somebody comes along to uh, show me otherwise. Trump controls the uh, the narrative when it comes to the Republicans, even though he's been deplatformed for the most mm -hmm. part from all so from all of his from Twitter and from the rest of social media. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that uh, any you know one of the, one of the funniest stories of the of the last week was uh, uh, Trump started his own uh, social media thing, except he doesn't have one, but he he started a company that supposedly is going to develop a social media site, which merged with a SPAC, a special purpose access company, and went on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, no product, no service, no nothing, and went up 900 some percent in the first couple of days. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's that's Republicans uh, eating the Kool-Aid and or drinking the Kool-Aid. And, uh, and uh, I'm not sure. I mean, we, there might be a, a switch to a Republican control of the House and the Senate uh, in uh, 2022, but become but come 2024, if Trump is still the candidate, look out below. Nothing good is going to happen. I mean, mm -hmm. Trump versus uh, Harris or, or Biden, if he's still alive, I, I, I hate to think of, of, of how how ugly that that election and the results of that election would be. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that the 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 Republicans were better alternative, especially Trump Republicans. You know, if they were Goldwater Republicans, I'd be all for it. You know, it'd be there would certainly be a lesser of two evils. In this case, it's just just a different evil. It's just but, evil versus evil. Why yep. evil versus evil? Yeah. <laughs> well, we can actually explain this drop in a uh, in a uh, support by essentially one number. Federal debt has surpassed one hundred seventy five thousand dollars per household. I mean, that right there will tell you how much more debt can each household take on besides their own. And we're taking on more and more debt. While at the same time, we have Washington po Washington Post columnist Michelle Maynard saying, empty shelves, ah, just get used to it and quit your whining. Sit down, shut up, and, and deal with your empty shelves. Go stand here yeah, with it. <laughs> It's not just the Washington Post. The press secretary, the federal, you know, the United States uh, government press secretary said essentially the same thing. Oh, you're not going to get your treadmill on time? Tough noogies. Uh, you know, we're looking at uh, an administration that is, to say the very least, out of touch with the suffering that is being imposed on the American people by the lockdowns over the last two years. And the lockdowns are bipartisan, not tripartisan. The Republic, the libertarians have been in opposition from the get. We were talking about the damage the lockdowns would do in the spring of 2020. I mean, way ahead of the curve. We knew that we would end up with uh, monstrous economic problems uh, and the the, the uh, supply chains shut down the, the fact that uh, boats are uh, anchored outside of Los Angeles and tearing up uh, their anchors are tearing up uh, uh, oil pipelines and and truckers are not available to drive the trucks food care f food service workers are not available to uh, cook and serve the food uh, nobody is available to drive the food, uh, to deliver the food, or to deliver Amazon packages. All of these supply chain problems are a total uh, result, entirely the result, not of the pandemic, but of the lockdown and the uh, the uh, government spending and federal Federal Reserve monetary printing, so designed to ease the pain of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So if people are sitting home getting uh, thousands of dollars in. Uh, welfare benefits, unemployment compensation, or bumps, and uh, so forth and so on. Why, the, why should they go to work at a at a crummy job? I wouldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, we're, 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 we 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 the politicians sow the whirlwind. We 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 the people are reaping the whirlwind, and the politicians are saying, uh, you know, put on a a mask and and buck up. Mm. Yeah, I remember. I remember the last. Uh president that asked people to lower their ex ex their expectations. Uh, his name was Jimmy Carter and <laughs> talked about uh, a belief in the future uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that we'd have to suck it up and, and just do with less and be patient. And that's just the way the world works. He was a, a one-term president who got tossed out on his ear very quickly. Uh, when, you know, the, the American people might be stupid enough to elect these people, you know, just because they hope for, for better and that this guy will be not as bad as the last guy. 
But once this guy proves to be not only as bad, maybe worse in many ways than the last guy, but ask, ask them to accept the lot that he's imposed on them, they're going to throw him out on his ear. And so uh, yeah, this, is not, this is not a political uh, strategy or political tactics that, are, that is, that is going to, it's not going to hold. You, you, can't, you can't tell people to accept this, something when Richard pointed out, quite frankly, that what's the term, panic-demic, that uh, it's not the virus that's, that's causing these problems, it's the government programs to combat the virus that's calling these, causing these programs or causing these problems. And everybody's realizing it, except for the people who are still drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, anyway, it's, yeah, it's, but they've, they've, oh, sorry, John. They've clamped down on the economy. They they clamped down on the deliberately broke the supply chains, and now they're going to say, "Ah, you're going to have to sit back and just manage your expectations." Now, I'm actually someone who actually agrees we should probably better properly manage our expectations. But having being able to buy your your uh, oh treadmill, or in my case, go to the store and buy food at the grocery store four blocks down the street from me that's supposed to open, that's delayed its opening from till January sometime because they can't get enough stuff to fill the shelves. And so there's a problem. But this is all kind of deliberate, accidentally on purpose, broke the supply chain. And now they're going to pretend that it's somehow, oh, it's capitalism's fault. It's the free market's fault that the supply chain is broken. Or what is it? Um, Biden said he, he negotiated with the ports to keep them open 24 hours. No, he negotiated with the unions who were keeping the port clo not open 24 hours. It wasn't the port who was wanting to stay closed. It was the unions who were keeping the store the, the port closed. This is ah, it's just so frustrating that people don't see that all this underneath. And speaking of, control. speaking of the, of the port closures, uh, on his CNN town hall, uh, Biden had to re be reminded that there are two ports off Southern California. The, the one he couldn't seem to remember was Long Beach, but the host very uh, conveniently and very uh, uh, considerately uh, said, told him that, you know, Long Beach. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Long Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we have a weekend at Bernie's president. There's no question about that. And uh, <laughs> if, if it wasn't so amusing, it would be scary or, or maybe it's the other way around. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I have a problem with, no, we don't have much time. You know, in the past, I've always thought that it's best to have incompetent people in government because they uh, do less damage. But now we're giving incompetent people almost infinite power and they're doing horrible damage. So I think that the, the, my, my, I wish on any election, it says none of the above, leave the chair empty. Uh, leave the chair empty. That should be our new slogan for the next election. We don't need a freaking president. We certainly don't need an imperial president. We do not need people to to guide us. Just get out of our way and let us do what we need to do. The only, the only problem with that is then then you leave the bureaucracy in charge, and that's that's yeah. And yeah, that's even worse than a president is having the bureaucracy in charge. But we are controlled by time, and we are out of time. So I want to thank John and. And Richard, for being here, I want to thank you all for watching us. And from Team Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Please visit us at http colon slash slash www.libertariancounterpoint.com.